news starts right now. The annual Holy Week pilgrimage by Mexican shoppers coming to San Antonio this year won't be what it used to be. Since the pandemic began, much of the travel from Mexico has stopped. Ports of entry along the border are closed to non-essential traffic, so no visitors, no shoppers. As a result, San Antonio's travel and hotel industries have seen dramatic declines. Jesse Degollado now with the renewed effort by Congressman Henry Cuellar to resume normal traffic on the international bridges connecting the United States and Mexico. The dismal sight last December of a virtually empty international bridge was about the same time the push was on to resume normal traffic. We got very, very, very close and opened up the border, but it just didn't open. Not in time for Christmas or the other big Mexican shopping holiday, Holy Week. And still, you know, I, I don't see any changes coming coming around soon. Laredo Chamber of Commerce President Miguel Conchas might have reason for renewed hope now that Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas is considering Congressman Henry Cuellar's request. And I hope they can open this up, uh, hopefully no more than 60 days from now. If, says Cuellar, they can agree on COVID-19 screening protocols. Cuellar also says he can't understand why many undocumented arrivals are allowed in the U.S., but not legal visa holders, thousands of them who'd be shopping here during Semana Santa. So that's a contradiction that the administration needs to fix very soon. And the fact, he says, that Mexican citizens can fly into the U.S., but not enter the country by land. It's a discriminatory, in my perspective, even this newly arrived passenger seems to agree. Above all, they should see the entire economy of South Texas, including San Antonio. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Happening tonight, we are still awaiting the arrival of migrant children to San Antonio who will be sheltered temporarily at Freeman Coliseum's Expo Hall. As many as 2,400 children who cross the U.S.-Mexico border without an adult family member will be housed there. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf says they expect most children to be there for up to a week before being released to either a family member here in the U.S. or a licensed care facility here in San Antonio. The 60-day agreement to house the children expires on May 30th. San Antonio's police chief will not authorize the release of body cam video of the fatal shooting of a man by police last winter. When police shot and killed 26-year-old Eric Mejia outside South Park Mall last winter, the incident recorded on the body cam of one of the officers. Police Chief William McManus citing a request from Mejia's mother issued a statement saying he will not authorize the release of the video, a decision that the mayor said today he understands. If there is a, a family that can that is going to be re-traumatized and there's not a public safety interest in the release of the footage, uh, then that is uh, seems to be a reasonable um, uh, use of the discretion that the chief has under state statute. In a letter to the city manager explaining his decision, the chief said the victim's mother indicated the release of the video would, quote, cause her great distress, end quote. San Antonio police are searching for a suspected shooter who was last seen running towards Balcones Heights from a nearby apartment. It started at the Trio apartment complex in the 1200 block of Babcock near Hillcrest Drive just after midnight. When they arrived, police tell us they found a man suffering from gunshot wounds to his leg and chest. Officers say he had been involved in an argument with a woman just before he was shot by someone. The woman was gone before police got to the scene, and it is unclear what role she played. The man was taken to the hospital, where he is now recovering. We are still waiting for an update on the alleged stabbing of a Von Ormy police officer. The Bear County Sheriff's Office, Office actually said it happened around 1030 last night in the 1800 block of Jet Road. That's near Palo Alto, outside of Loop 1604 in South Bear County. Deputies say the officer was working a rodeo event when he says he was attacked and stabbed in the ankle. The incident remains under investigation.
Infertility creates enough stress as it is, anxiety, depression, and isolation. Then you add a pandemic and those feelings are elevated. That's why we're addressing the subject, attempting to break the stigma ahead of our town hall on Wednesday. It's called pregnancy and infertility in the pandemic. Courtney Friedman checked in with an expert as well as a member of our own KSAT family who shares her story of infertility. Catching up with a dear friend and coworker after months apart in a pandemic, the laughs came easy. <laughs> but digital journalist and reporter Erica Hernandez was actually there to talk about a really tough subject. After about a year and a half um, and all, there's a lot of tests, um, all the tests we were, um, it came back that we had unexplained infertility. Results that caused even more stress for Erica and her husband, Ryan. Well, I had other friends or, or family members who knew what was wrong. For us, there was no answer. It's just not happening. So two years ago, they decided to foster and adopt, finally getting to adopt Liana just last month. And now that we've done the parenting thing now, we're like, okay, let's, let's, Let's try again. So she's about to start fertility treatments in the middle of a pandemic. While before you could meet in person with people in support groups, now it's not possible anymore. So you become even more isolated. If you want to go to find to talk to a doctor or a specialist, then you cannot go with your partner. Fertility coach and licensed counselor Dr. Linda Strano Burton runs free infertility support groups and says her clients bring up many stressors associated with the pandemic, including the vaccine. We discuss our worries, our anxieties, but we also discuss what are ways that we can become more educated. So one thing that we usually do is uh, let's look at journals, let's look at the, the latest research. And I think there's such a stigma, especially with infertility. A lot of women don't want to talk about it or they're afraid to talk about it or they're embarrassed to talk about it. But she says deciding to open up is what's brought her a sense of calm, empowerment, and even freedom. <laughs> Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Now this Wednesday, Courtney is hosting a live stream town hall at 2 p.m. It's called Parenting and Infertility in a Pandemic. You can catch it on KSAT.com or on the KSAT TV app, anywhere you stream. If you have any questions for our panel of experts, and you can see them there on your screen, you can submit them right now on our website, KSAT.com. You'll find a story promoting the town hall and asking for your input. Let's talk vaccines now. Today's the day all adults in Texas now eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine. The eligibility expansion also includes teenagers aged 16 and 17. But the Texas Department of State Health Services says providers should continue to prioritize those 80 and older. That's why places like the Alamo Dome are now offering those 80 and up to get the shot without an appointment during the afternoon hours Tuesday through Saturday. The only exception is the upcoming Good Friday. You can find more information posted with the story right now at KSAT.com. When a COVID patient ends up on a ventilator, it opens a world of complications for recovery. Now a specialist at UT Health has taken a look at a simple procedure that may eliminate that for patients in the ICU with lung issues. Ursula Perry with his newly released research into the simple tracheotomy and how it might be the answer. Having enough ventilators early on during the COVID-19 pandemic was a huge issue for cities and states, but then came the complications from using them so much. These individuals, because they are breathing with assisted ventilation, have an increased risk for developing pneumonia because uh, your immune system is weakened, um, you have something that's now foreign inside your body. Surviving the virus by using a ventilator often resulted in the need for long-term rehab weeks, even months later. And that's why Dr. Moriera's research that looked at 17 clinical trials and 3,000 patients is so important. He looked at what impact a tracheotomy early on instead of a ventilator might have. When this was performed in a critically adult individual, we found that it not only decreased uh, these individuals from getting ventilator associated pneumonia, but it also decreased the duration of mechanical ventilation as well as the total number of ICU days. 
COVID-19 patients were not used in this research, in part because initially there was fear that the procedure might easily spread the virus to the medical staff. Now they know how it can be contained during a tracheotomy. The UT Health San Antonio study was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Dr. Morera says it's getting a lot of interest because one year into the pandemic, doctors are ready to turn the page and start treating those with coronavirus the same as any other critically ill patient. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look at the roadways right now with your time saver traffic. This is a shot right now of 410 at Jackson Keller, where as you can see, happy Monday, everybody. Yeah. Yeah, traffic is smooth sailing out there in both directions. You can also see the temperature down in the corner. Pretty nice. Good, Sarah yeah. Spivey, 76 degrees. Yeah, very nice out there right now. In fact, we're actually seeing temperatures drop and an updated look at the temp. It's actually 72 degrees outside, ah. so it's going to feel pretty great tonight. And now temperatures will fall into the low 60s by midnight. One thing you'll notice, though, clouds are going to increase. And over the next few hours, unfortunately, the mugginess is going to increase. By tomorrow morning, we'll be seeing dew points in the 60s with areas of patchy drizzle. So tomorrow is going to look a lot different and feel a lot different than today. We're going to start off the day in the 60s tomorrow, but We'll be getting up into the 80s. I'll have a look ahead to Easter weekend and our next cold front. All right, we are standing by for our uh, daily briefing, which as of today is no longer going to be daily. These are moving now from Monday to Thursday, an indication that things are going well in our community. Yeah, two times a week instead of the five times a week that they were doing. So this will be one of two updates this week and for weeks to come, hopefully, and I'm hoping we get to a place where there are no updates because the coronavirus is done at this point. And speaking of that, of course, today, the first day that all adults are eligible to get a vaccine. Let's check in with City Hall right now and Mayor Ron Nuremberg. Update for the San Antonio community. As of yesterday in San Antonio uh, and in Bear County, we have 461,093 people who have received their first dose vaccine, as well as 263 people, 263,611 people who are fully vaccinated. Uh, both numbers that we are gl very glad to see, those continue to tick up considerably day to day. More than three months into our Bear County vaccination drive effort, almost 60% of residents 65 and older have received at least one dose of the COVID. 19 vaccine. This shows again the tremendous effort by all vaccination sites and hospitals to prioritize those who are over 65. Recent vaccine analysis also shows that 30% of all Bear County residents over the age of 16 have received at least one dose of the vaccine. As a reminder, as others continue to wait for their vaccine appointment, let's continue to wear our masks and social distance as we work to get those vaccines out. Um, as a reminder, Metro Health still has some COVID-19 vaccine appointments reserved for those who do not have access to the Internet. If, you, if that is you, you can book your appointment by, by phone by calling 311 and hitting option 8. The 311 hotline hours are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and Saturday and Sunday, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Remember, you can also subscribe to our vaccine appointment reminders. Uh, be alerted by text when vaccine appointments become available for registration. You can do that by texting vaccine or vacuna to 55000. Tonight, we are reporting 159 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total to 205,258 since the pandemic began. Our seven-day rolling average on cases is 183. Our positivity rate, here's some good news, has dropped a bit more. We're now at 2.05%. Fortunately, we also have no new deaths to report today, but please, again, bear in mind that this uh, pandemic has taken quite a toll on our community and every single one of those who we've lost, uh, we continue to mourn for, so please keep their families in your prayers tonight. There are 192 COVID-19 patients in our local hospitals this evening. That's up a little bit from yesterday. There were 20 new admissions in the last 24 hours, 78 patients in the ICU tonight, and 38 on ventilators. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. I think it's really important <clears throat> that we all continue to be careful. Uh, if you notice in, in the news coming out today, uh, that infections are on a rise across the United States. There were some 61,000 
545 infected people last uh, last week. That's 11 percent more than the average for the last two weeks. So this variant B117, uh, they know they've got over 8,000 cases of that, and it's 50 percent more transmittable. So let's not let up our guard. We, 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 we're sure we're probably some of that here. And uh, we don't want to take a chance of another outbreak. We are rushing as fast as we can to get uh, shots in the arms. Uh, we'll have we'll had about 5,000 people out at the uh, University Hospital site today. And uh, <clears throat> we expect uh, probably another 1,000 or so more uh, for the last two hours. Uh, last week, we did about 29,000 uh, vaccines, and that was all basically school and school personnel, some via bus drivers. And <clears throat> tomorrow we should be opening up a registration for more people uh, for the rest of this week and for next week. Great. Thank you, Judge. Um, now, last week we introduced a frequently asked question of the day. These are the questions that Metro Health at our 311 hotline receive re regularly. And during the briefing, uh, we're going to continue to share those questions each day. Tonight, we are lucky to have Dr. Bridger, who will be answering our question. And that is, if a vaccine, Dr. Bridger, is showing 95% efficacy, does that mean that 5% who are vaccinated would still get COVID-19? So um, I encourage people not to think of it in terms of 5% and 95%, but rather think about the fact that what this is saying to you is that it's not 100% um, and that a very small number of people may still get COVID after they've been vaccinated. But the key is that somebody who has been vaccinated it will have a less severe form of COVID than somebody who has not. So um, even if you're vaccinated and you get COVID, you will not have as bad of the illness as if you had not been vaccinated. So everybody. All right, question of the day there that uh, Dr. Colleen Bridger with Metro Health is answering. Some good news, really good news in this update today. 2.05% is our positivity rate. It was up as high as the 20s at one yeah. point in San Antonio, so that's great that it's down to 2.05. And of course, the numbers that we're seeing in people getting vaccinated. Yeah, and uh, that's one of the things that will change about these briefings on Mondays and Thursdays. We're going to focus more on the vaccination and where we are in terms of that. As you heard, the mayor said there, 60% uh, of those 65 and older are vaccinated. 30% over the age of 16 mm -hmm. are vaccinated, so really doing well. And of course, call 311 and keep an eye on those updates. Um, they'll be rolling out in the coming days for more availability now that everyone is eligible to get a vaccine. And I actually think he said that Metro Health right now has appointments available. If you dial 311, if you can't get to the internet, they have that availability. All right, let's talk weather right now and to talk about the fact that there's a cold front headed our way, yeah. Sarah. Yeah, a cold front. It's going to make it feel a little bit cooler by the middle of the week here in San Antonio. And now we do not have to worry about freezes. So that is some good news. I know that we're a little uh, cold shocked from February's storm, but today was a beautiful day. We got up to 75 degrees in the afternoon. This morning's low was chilly, 47, uh, but we quickly warmed up under plenty of sun. Thank goodness we were nowhere close to that record of 94 set back in the year 2000. So looking ahead to the forecast, we are going to see clouds increase tonight. You'll notice that even in the high res future cast, you can see some green here. That's because we are expected to see some drizzle in the early morning hours. It'll be patchy, but it may impact your morning commute. 61 degrees for the start of the day tomorrow. And then by the afternoon, we are going to have mostly cloudy skies, a few peaks of sunshine, and it'll be warm and muggy. 82 for the high, and you'll feel every degree of that 82 degrees. A little bit warmer out to the west toward Del Rio, where temperatures should get to 90 degrees because of plenty of sunshine. But as we mentioned, a cool front is on the way. You can see all the snow across the northern Rockies. Here's where that front is right now, and it is going to move through Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning, it'll move through and it'll allow for temperatures to be in the 30 in the part of me in the 60s on Wednesday for the high and mornings in the 40s with afternoons in the 60s as well. It's also going to make it very windy on Wednesday. We'll see wind gusts of up to 40 miles per hour behind that front on Wednesday, so a lot like yesterday. Very windy and then looking ahead to Easter weekend. Things look great. Comfortable mornings and comfortable afternoons. Easter looks perfect. Yeah, it does. thanks so much, Sarah.
All right, so there's a new spur in town. Will he play tonight, Greg Simmons? The answer is no, but he was introduced today at today's shoot around. And depending on who you ask, he's either six foot ten or six foot eleven. Anyway, a big guy. When we come back, we'll introduce you to the newest member of the Spurs, Gorgie Zhang, and UTSA's first spring workout for their football team coming up. San Antonio Spurs resume their franchise record nine game homestand tonight. They will have a new member on the roster. He is center Gorgie Zhang, who was signed last night but will not make his debut tonight when the Spurs face the Sacramento Kings. His name is Gorgie, translated into the old one in his native language. At 31, will resume his NBA career in silver and black after he was cut by the Memphis Grizzlies on March the 26th after spending most of his career with the Minnesota Timberwolves after being drafted in the first round in 2013. The 6'10 center is expected to fill the void on the front line after the Spurs bought out the contract of LaMarcus soldiers who is now signed with the Nets. Zhang said over the last couple of days have been like going through college recruiting and told us why he likes the Spurs. They got a good system. You know, the ball don't stop. The ball move around. Uh, they play together. It's a together team and they have a Hall of Fame coach that, uh, you know, know how to run this team. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to see what, what they're all about. All right, maybe we will see him on Wednesday when they take on the Kings again. But for tonight, 7.30 tip, highlights for you tonight on the night beat. Baylor has to be happy. Both their men's and women's teams are in the Elite Eight and are playing to go to the Final Four today at both NCAA tournaments, including the women's tournament being held right here in San Antonio. Both won Saturday when the men defeating Villanova 62-51 with a win tonight against number three Arkansas will advance to the Final Four for the first time in nine years. Meantime, San Antonio native Alyssa Smith came up big in Baylor's 78-75 overtime victory over Michigan on Saturday, the East Central alum finished 11 for 11 from the floor with 24 points, tying an NCAA regional record for the most field goals without a miss in a single game. They're going to need that and then some right now because take a look. They're back on the floor as we speak in the Alamo Dome, and they've just gone to the second quarter. UConn is leading Baylor right now 26-24. The sixth-ranked Texas Longhorn scored a big upset last night by knocking off number two Maryland. Another San Antonio native comes up with some big plays. Late second quarter, Kyra Lambert out of shirts, pulls up, hits the elbow jumper. Longhorns got the lead down to seven at halftime. Then in the fourth quarter, game tied at 59. Lauren Ebo pokes the ball away. It bounces right to Lambert, who puts the Longhorns up for good with a lay-in. Texas advances to the Elite Eight for the first time since 2016. 64-61 is the final. Here's a look at their next game. They'll take on number one C South Carolina tomorrow at six in the Alamo Dome. The UTSA Roadrunners football team held their first spring workout under second year head coach Jeff Trailer after the COVID-19 pandemic wiped out last year's spring practices despite all the challenges and included limited workouts, constant testing and a schedule that seemed to change weekly. The Roadrunners were still able to score seven big wins, including a five and two record in Conference USA and should have played for the conference championship. Now with most of the team returning, including seniors with an extra year of eligibility due to the pandemic, it's about building on what they started. So how did the first day go? We're just so much better um, and the details. Uh, we just look like a, a football team that knows what we're doing, actually. Uh, and uh, now it's time to take that and take it to another level. Uh, so that was very pleasing. It's a great feeling going out there, you know, doing what we love. And you just can't take it for granted because, you know, this time last year, we weren't able to have a spring ball. So just going out there, you got to just cherish the moment. You know, it's just great to be out there with the guys, and uh, we had a fun time. And they tell us no COVID problems. The Roadrunners kick off their 2021 season on the road September the 4th at Illinois. And I don't know how often they have to go through testing, but that was certainly a lot of drama last year, yeah. where oh, it was just yeah. about an everyday event. It was like Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Yeah, and a positive test, you were out. You are out for 14 days. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Greg. Okay, side Q&A is coming up next. We'll be right back. So could the state of Texas have a similar so-called election integrity law that they have in the state of Georgia? It's something that's being discussed in Austin. As a matter of fact, the governor's made it one of his priorities. Uh, state Representative Diego Bernal joins us now live. Uh, Diego, thank you for joining us. And, and I want to talk about that and other issues. But I mean, I talk about the bill. I mean, I know there's a couple competing bills, one in the Senate, one in the House that have to do with so-called election integrity. How would you right. term what they are compared to what we're seeing in the state of Georgia? I think they're a lot like Georgia. They don't have the provision about passing out water to people in line, but both of them, SB6 and SB7, uh, they have provisions that I think make it harder to vote. For example, they would allow more people 
to be poll watchers that could literally stand right next to you and watch you vote. Um, they have a provision that makes curbside voting. So if you're disabled, you're driving someone who's disabled, who wants to vote, they can bring the, the ballot out to them at the car. It would require for curbside voting everyone to get out of the car except for the driver or the person helping, including kids, while poll watchers could leer in and watch you vote. Um, and it also makes it harder to get assistance voting. So it, re it re requires someone, if I needed someone to help me vote, that person would have to come, fill out a form, who they are, who they are to me, why I need the help, and they would have to have voter ID themselves. So that would almost disqualify every young kid, let's say 15, 14 and below, from helping their parents out to vote. Uh, and then there's other restrictions on elected officials saying that we couldn't offer someone a mail-in ballot unless we know they already qualify. So it just makes it harder for us to do. So all of these things I believe are designed to make it harder to vote and to keep some people from voting. So it's very much like Georgia. It's got a fast path. Both bills have a fast path and uh, we'll see what happens. You know, on the national level, there's already a, a big fight, a big push underway to uh, fight back against that law there in Georgia. And considering how the election rules here in Texas are already among the most restrictive in the nation, and there's clearly a lot of opposition here in Texas, what are the chances of either of these bills actually passing? Well, unfortunately, the chances of them passing are very high. Um, the, Texas is a, is a leadership wise, is, is a red state. These are red bills. They're going to sail through. The best chance we have are people from both sides of the aisle saying that they don't want it and putting pressure on elected officials, putting pressure on the lieutenant governor, the governor, and so forth. But also, we could also be bailed out by DC if, if the federal government passes the John Lewis Act. And a lot of those provisions would nullify what's being proposed here. So we've got two bites at the apple, but the likelihood of it passing right now is very high unless, unless something else happens. Mm. What do you say to those who say there's a legitimate concern about our election integrity out there, like the governor, for instance? Look, the governor can say that, but he can't prove it. In fact, his own lieutenant governor and the AG went through an exercise of reviewing thousands, tens of thousands of ballots. And what they found in terms of fraud was so small that there's a higher likelihood, and I'm not making the math up, there's a higher likelihood of getting struck by lightning than there is voting fraud in the state of Texas. So that leads me to believe these motivations are not based on principle, but based on politics. And so I think we need to take the politics out of the exercise of voting and just leave it to the candidates themselves. I want to talk really quickly about the winter storm that we had last month. New reports show the death toll is actually higher than initially thought. In fact, the uh, Texas Tribune has put that number at 111 people who died from that storm. It is also said to be among the costliest disasters in Texas history. Um, can you talk to us about what's happening at the state level to address this historic storm? Sure, that's a, it's a great question. There's essentially three things happening. One is a, sort of a fight over what to do with the outstanding bill that exists as a result of leaving, of, of having the megawatt hours go up to $9,000 per megawatt hour. So we've got the billing piece that we're trying to work through. Then you've got discussions about the market itself and whether or not the way that Texas is, is structured makes sense in the future. And then the last part, which is the most important part to me, is we have to make physical mechanical changes to these plants. And instruments and machinery and pipes froze. The only way to really make sure this doesn't happen again is to weatherize them and that comes with a cost. So I, there is an effort to fix it. I think they're going in reverse order. I think they should be focusing on the mechanical fix and then the market and then of course deal with the bill which I think will get dealt with. But instead they're focusing on the money part the market part and then sort of leaving the mechanical part to the end. And, and yeah. So they're all on the table. I just think they're going in the wrong direction. Yeah. Do, are you I mean, you guys are on a time limit up there, you know, unless a special session is called for certain things. Are you right. worried that that's not going to get addressed before the session ends? I think it'll get addressed. I think what I'm worried about is whether or not it gets addressed in a meaningful way. In other words, I don't want them to deliver something that emotionally makes people feel better but doesn't leave us better off when it happens again. And it will happen again. What I'm more interested in is if we do it right. So, so they'll do something. I just want to make sure they do it right. Um, I think there's a high likelihood that happens, but it hasn't happened yet. And I've learned that until it happens, you have to be wary until you get the final signature on the document. Representative Diego Bernal, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much. Take care. We'll be right back.
COVID-19 cases are rising in nearly half of U.S. states, prompting new concerns about a fourth surge. Yeah, the uptick in cases comes as the U.S. reported a record number of vaccinations on Sunday. ABC's Elizabeth Schultze has the latest from Washington. With COVID-19 cases on the rise in nearly half the country, health officials are warning about a possible fourth wave of the virus. New infections now surpassing 60,000 a day, about a 12% increase since last week. I know you all so badly want to be done. We are just almost there, but not quite yet. At the same time, a new record in the U.S. for daily vaccinations. Almost 3.3 million Americans vaccinated on Sunday. And more states are expanding eligibility. In Texas, all adults are now eligible. And in Florida, anyone above age 40 can get vaccinated. Like Cedell Roundtree in Miami. Now we can be as a family again. But the shot didn't come soon enough for so many Americans, including Virginia doctor Emmanuel Stiff, who lost his fight to COVID after contracting the virus in January. He's just always been there as a constant in my life. The death toll in the U.S. is approaching a staggering 550,000. A top health official who helped lead the pandemic response under former President Trump, telling CNN the number didn't have to be that high, raising questions about why she didn't speak out more forcefully at the time. There were about 100,000 deaths that came from that original surge. All of the rest of them, in my mind, could have been mitigated or decreased substantially. The Biden administration now getting high marks for its response. A new ABC News Ipsos poll finds 72 percent approve of the president's handling of the pandemic. And today, Mexico is thanking the Biden administration for sending it one and a half million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine. It's part of an effort the White House calls vaccine diplomacy. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News, Washington. Live cam right now, 76 degrees, although it's cooler than that. As yeah. we learned in our last <laughs> weather update. Yeah. Don't always believe the bug in the corner. Gotta believe keep you guys honest, the right? The weather authority <laughs> meteorologists of KSAT 12. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. He's hyped me up. Yeah. All right. It's actually 72 degrees at the airport. 73 at Stinson, 74 in Pleasanton. You could see the clouds moving in. We are going to see increasing clouds tonight and increasing humidity. Coming up in the forecast, we'll talk about how tomorrow we'll have patchy drizzle. It'll be muggy. It'll be warm. Wednesday, we're going to get a cold front, making it very windy. And of course, a look ahead to cooler and pleasant weather coming up in the week. All that forecast. In a hopeful sign for the economy, travel sites Airbnb and VRBO are reporting a boom in online reservations. VRBO, which stands for Vacation Rentals by Owner, is said to be off to its best start in a quarter century. Shares of rival Airbnb are up more than 20% this year following the company's successful initial public offering in 2020. Airbnb's hosts have earned a combined $1 billion since the pandemic began last year. Meanwhile, Expedia stock, which owns VRBO, has soared more than 30%. Analysts believe consumers are ready to travel and vacation again with the end of the pandemic in sight. Well, Lindsay Lohan has dropped a new song as an NFT. Now, NFTs are something called non-fungible tokens, which are digital collector items that have revolutionized the art market in recent months. Yeah, we'd go more into NFTs, but we only have an hour show. <laughs> Her new song, Lullaby, is being sold on the digital platform Fans Forever. According to the website, it's a collaboration between Lohan and DJ Manuel Riva that's meant to deliver a message of empowerment. As of Monday morning, the auction was up to 500,000 TRX, which is more than $32,000. A sporting goods store chain is launching a new store concept. Dick Sporting Goods has opened what it has called an experimental store in New York. The retailer has dubbed the store Dick's House of Sport. The place features a rock climbing wall, indoor wellness spaces, and an outdoor field for sporting events. Yeah, the company says customers at the location will get a hands-on shopping experience with the products as well as help from fitness experts. The store points to the shift towards at-home workouts and outdoor exercise is a big reason 
for its recent successful quarter. And good news, Earth is safe from an interstellar asteroid for another hundred years. Yeah, according to NASA, asteroid 99942 Opif, op, Apophis. Apophis, thank you, Sarah, won't impact our planet. The roughly 1,100 foot space rock was discovered in 2004. Yeah, scientists immediately worried it could strike Earth during a pass in 2029. Further study of its orbit around the sun ruled that out, then ruled out a hit in 2036. But researchers still worried it could crash into Earth in 2068. Well, new analysis using radar observations snuffed out the possibility of impact on that pass as well. I feel like there's a Hollywood movie out there somewhere that very much is in line with that. Oh, there is was there? one. Was there? What, yeah, which, which Bruce one was Willis it? and Ben Affleck, okay. Asteroid, they went Which up one, Alex? Armageddon. Armageddon, that's it. Okay. There you go. Yeah, Speaking they went of, up and had to blow up the asteroid. Right. And Speaking yeah. of impossible movies, you guys remember A Day After Tomorrow? No? Yes. Never seen it. Okay. That cannot happen meteorologically, <laughs> so we don't need to worry about that as well. Okay. Just a there are a lot of weather movies. There You're are. Like Twister and Perfect Storm yeah. and, you know. I'm critical of them all, except I think <laughs> Twister. Twister is a classic, and it's pretty good. We got cows. We got yeah. temperatures <laughs> in, the fifth, in the 70s out there. We had a high temperature of 75, two degrees cooler than our average high temperature of 77. Meanwhile, it was a lot warmer out toward Del Rio, 82 degrees for the high in Del Rio. Tomorrow, Del Rio could reach 90 degrees. Now, outside it feels great if you wanted to end your day sitting on the patio. Uh, temperatures are in the 70s, as I just mentioned, and dew points are pleasant in the 30s. That's pretty dry on our scale. It's been nice and dry with low humidity, but notice how Corpus Christi, those dew points are starting to rise, and over the next couple of hours here into the overnight hours, we're going to see the return of mugginess. By tomorrow afternoon, dew points will be in the upper 60s. You will feel the muggy conditions. And tomorrow morning, that humidity may just impact your morning commute in the form of drizzle and even some patchy fog possible too. So notice how clouds return by the start of the day tomorrow. It's going to be cloudy with areas of drizzle in the low 60s for the morning low. And then as we head into the afternoon, it'll be difficult for us to shake the clouds. They'll be stubborn. They'll stick around through probably about lunch and then into the afternoon. We'll see peaks of sunshine, a high temperature here in San Antonio, quite a bit warmer than today, 82 degrees. And as I mentioned, there are some areas that will see a lot more sunshine like Del Rio, Catula, Laredo. Those areas are going to get up into the 90s tomorrow. Uh, so it is going to be a warm and a muggy, muggy Tuesday with that small chance for drizzle in the morning. Now, a wider view of the nation will we'll tell you what's headed our way. It's fairly quiet across the U.S. No major issues except for some storms in the northern uh, Rockies and some snow showers rather in the northern Rockies. That's around a low pressure system. And notice how cold the temperatures are behind this cold front. 32 in Casper, Wyoming, 23 in Cutbank, Montana. We are going to see this cold front move through San Antonio on Wednesday. Now our temperatures won't be as cold as freezing, but we are going to see a much cooler second half of the week. So let me take you through the future cast for that cold front arriving on Wednesday morning. I wish I could tell you we're going to get some good rain from this, but it doesn't look like it. Instead, what we'll see is a 20% chance for isolated showers on Wednesday, especially in the morning as that front moves through. And then another big impact from this cold front is going to be how windy it will be behind the front. Wind gusts of up to 40 miles per hour from the north behind that front. So if you have any loose patio furniture or perhaps if you have any uh, flimsy house plants outside, you may want to bring them in with those winds from the north gusting up to 40 miles per hour and temperatures will fall into the 40s for the mornings. Again, we're not worried about a freeze and then in the afternoons we'll be sitting pretty in the 60s. So a pretty nice and comfortable end to the work week. So just a reminder tomorrow morning, patchy drizzle, muggy and we'll shake some clouds in the afternoon. 82 gusts up to 20 miles per hour from the south, but it's Wednesday. That'll really be our gusty day with that small chance for rain and then looking ahead to Easter week it's going to be pretty nice for Easter egg hunts or any kind of ac outdoor activities with the family. Temperatures will be in the 70s for Easter weekend. Thank you, Sarah. In case you missed it, it's coming up next.
Hope you had an awesome weekend. Good morning, everybody. Let's get the week rolling. It is Monday, March 29th. Breaking news happening in the medical center area. San Antonio police at the scene of a fatal shooting in the 8000 block of Oakdale Way. That's near Hamilton Wolf and Babcock Road. People involved as roommates here at the apartment complex, and there was an incident involving video games and a gun. It wasn't clear how the victim ended up being shot, and the spokeswoman couldn't even confirm who pulled the trigger. The victim was hit in the torso, though, and died on scene. The two people have been arrested in connection with the murder of a 39-year-old man, 55-year-old Douglas Skaggs and 22-year-old Haley Gibbons, arrested in Austin on Friday. The victim, Tito Roman, Investigators say Roman and Gibbons went to the hotel, and while they were there, Roman was shot by Skaggs. Gibbons and Skaggs then took off in a red truck with another person. The two are awaiting extradition to Bear County. Tony, police investigating a shooting that happened outside of the Tommy's restaurant on Wordsbach Road last night. They say that two men were shot, one in the leg, the other in the chest, after leaving a birthday party at a nearby bar. The shooter reportedly fired more than two dozen rounds at them. In the meantime, we're awaiting the arrival of unaccompanied minors who will be temporarily housed at the Freeman Coliseum. We're told they could arrive as early as today, probably tonight. County Judge Nelson Wolf made the announcement last week, saying for now the agreement is for 60 days. The goal is to reunite them with family members in the U.S. within five to seven days. All others will be transferred to licensed care facilities. <laughs> Thanks for watching the 6 o'clock news. We'll see you right back here on the Night Beat at 10. Have a great night.